Okay, let's uh, have a word of prayer together and we'll move into our Bible study this evening. Father, thank you for your many kindnesses and your mercies to us. Lord, I'm, I'm so grateful for how you care for us and how your mercies are new every morning. And so your provision is always in abundance. It's always fresh. It's always new. And Lord, forgive us for the times when we've taken that for granted. When we've moved out of trusting and resting in your grace to presuming upon it. Father, tonight as we gather around your word, I pray that through your spirit, you would encourage us, you would challenge us, and that you would equip us to live out our faith. Be our teacher tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I guess I need to begin with a confession. Compassion is not my strong suit. Mercy is not really my gift, and I tend to be impatient. So I know what you're thinking. Note to self, if I'm having trouble, don't bother going to this guy. It's not as bad as I make it sound, but it is a really good thing that I'm not God. He is patient. He is long-suffering. He is caring, always, and He's sufficient. Yet there are times when He deals very directly with His people. There are times when the Lord in Scripture deals in a very upfront, direct manner with His people. And that's one of the things we're going to see tonight as we look at Jeremiah chapter 45. Jeremiah chapter 45, we're going to cover the entire chapter. All five verses of the chapter. And honestly, it's one of those chapters that you look at it and you read it and go, why is that here? Why even bother? And to be real honest with you, my plan was to just skip over it and go on to something else. But that, that would be a mistake. Why is it here? We're going to deal with that a little bit later. But I think there is an important word for Jeremiah, for Baruch, for the people then as well as us, about how believers are to live in tough, difficult times. Because that's not new. That's been around from the beginning. And I think there's an important word for us. Jeremiah 45, we're going to look at verse 1 through verse 5. This is a prophecy given to Jeremiah to deliver to his secretary, Baruch. It's also clear that the prophecy as it's given in chapter 45 is directly related to the events of chapter 36. You know that because of the way the, the, the chapter begins and you find the same wording in chapter 36. So you know that was the occasion in the fourth year of the king and so forth. So you are left wondering, why is it here? Well, Part of the reasoning, again, is because Jeremiah is not in chronological order. It's strategically placed for a reason. It's, it's intended to, to say something to the people to make a point. So it's, it's collected things that are put in a, a topical order more than a chronographical order. We'll, we'll deal more later with why specifically, but let's look together. Jeremiah 45, starting at verse 1. The word that Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch, the son of Neriah, when he wrote these words in a book at the direction of Jeremiah, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to you, O Baruch, you said, Woe is me, for the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I am weary with my groaning, and I find no rest. Thus shall you say to him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, what I have built, I am breaking down. What I have planted, I am plucking up. That is, the whole land. 
And do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. For behold, I'm bringing disaster upon all flesh, declares the Lord. But I will give you your life as a prize of war in all the places to which you may go. Interesting. But what does it mean? What does it mean for us? How, how do we come to this text and, and come away with something to strengthen us, to encourage us in our walk? I want, I want to point out three things from the text, and then I want to wrap it up with what I think the Lord is saying to Baruch, and in turn what He's saying to saints throughout the ages, what He's saying to us about times of heartache and distress. But let's begin. First, I want you to note the plight of a discouraged disheartened and disillusioned servant. So I guess I, I'll begin by asking you, how do those words strike you? We're talking about a servant of the Lord. We're talking about a man who was faithful to the work given to him. He was faithful to God. He was faithful to the truth of Scripture. He was willing to risk his life for the sake of God's work and God's kingdom. How do you feel when you read words like discouraged, disheartened, and disillusioned? Keeping in mind, always faithful. Keep in mind, consistent in loving the Lord, in serving the Lord, a good and godly man. A little bit disturbing, a little bit uncomfortable. that God would allow a faithful servant to be in that condition? Well, it certainly says something to our peace and prosperity friends. It says something to those of us who think faith in Christ delivers me from all heartache and trial. It, it delivers us from the, the wrong-headed thinking that uh, life in Christ is all sunshine and no rain that we ought to always live on the mountain and never travel the valley. Good, godly, faithful, disheartened, discouraged, and disillusioned. We're told in the opening verses that he wrote these words on a scroll at Jeremiah's dictation in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. Go back to chapter 36 and what do you read? In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of uh, Josiah, king of Judah, these words came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it the words that I spoke to you concerning Israel, Judah, and all the nations from the time I spoke to you. So Jeremiah summoned Baruch. So this is connected to that. Keep that in mind because that's going to be important here in a minute. So there's no question that 45 is connected and relate to the events of chapter 36. What do we know about Baruch? Well, we know he's from a wealthy and prominent family. We know that from the book itself and things, references that are made about him and his family. His grandfather had been governor. We know that from Jeremiah 32. We also know it from 2 Chronicles 34. His brother was a high-ranking official, 51 verse, chapter 51, verse 59. So he's a well-educated, well-connected person. We also know that he was a faithful servant. Again, willing to risk his life for the truth of God. And don't forget, if you go back to chapter 36, when Jeremiah has this scathing message for the leaders of Judah, he tells Baruch, you've got to deliver this sermon because I've been barred. This is the man who is discouraged, disheartened, and disillusioned. This is the man who said, according to verse 3, woe is me. He's announcing doom. He's announcing destruction. He's saying, this is the end. This is, a, this is a cry of pain. This is a cry of turmoil. Woe is me, for the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I am weary with my groaning, and I find no rest. 
So he's saying the Lord is the cause of all his trouble. The Lord is the cause of his turmoil. He's the cause of his pain. He's the cause of his groaning. This all gets traced back to him. The words convey weariness of body and of soul. Discouraged, disheartened, disillusioned. Now, why would Baruch be depressed? Because he has just finished writing down all the words that the Lord had given to Jeremiah. One, that's a difficult task in itself. He didn't have a laptop. He didn't have spell check. And every time he made a mistake, he had to take out a knife and scrape it off and start over. I mean, the task itself was enough. But second, have you read Jeremiah? Are you familiar with the message of Jeremiah? Baruch was from Judah. So all of this destruction, all of this famine, all of this death, that's about his home. That means it's about his family, his loved ones, his neighbors. In addition, he's close enough to the action to know how the people are going to respond to the message. They're not going to like what Jeremiah has to say. The leaders are furious. The people are already beginning to think Jeremiah is a traitor. A growing number want him dead. And that puts good old Baruch right in the line of fire. And again... Go back to 36. Oh, by the way, when you finish getting this all fixed up, I need you to go to the temple and read it because I can't go there. Put all that together. Do you understand why he might be a little blue? Can you see why he may be discouraged? Look at the wording again. Sorrow, pain, weary, groaning. Sorrow speaks of some form of grief. Pain refers to physical discomfort. Groaning refers to a, a burden on his heart. This is a man under great stress, and he's at the end of his rope. This good, faithful sermon, servant. He's a genuine believer, committed to obey God's command, He's willing to lay down his life, put his life on the line for the sake of obedience to the call and the command of his God, but he was a man. He was a man of flesh and bone. Too often we're reading in the Scripture and we come across a, a hero in the story and we don't think of him as being ordinary folk like you and me. We think, well, they've got something special. And I think clearly the Lord was with him. I think clearly the Lord was strengthening him and enabling him, the same as Jeremiah. But even with God's presence and God's enabling, there was heartache, discouragement. Because after all, he's a man. That means he's a frail child of Adam. And it means he struggled the same as all of us struggle. You do understand, it is possible to grow weary in well-doing. It's possible to be faithful to the call of God and experience the enabling of God, that uplifting spirit that enables you to go and do more than you thought you could ever do. It's possible, even in the midst of that, to be overwhelmed with trials and heartache and sorrow. Groaning is common to humanity. We're assured that our Savior understands. We are assured that our Savior identifies with our struggle. After all, our Savior is described as a man of sorrows well acquainted with grief. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, we don't have a Savior untouched. 
by our heartache. He's experienced it. He's felt it. He's known loneliness. He's known despair. All of those things because He was truly God and He was truly man. So He understands our weakness. He understands our infirmities. After all, the Lord Jesus from the cross cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Baruch, faithful, committed, determined, was overwhelmed with the burden he bare, he bore. O- overwhelmed by the heartache and the pain and the struggle. So, see him, discouraged his heart and disillusioned. Understand that God was with him, that God promised him things the same as we have been promised. And having all that in place and understanding all of that is part of what makes this next thing unnerving. The second thing I want you to note, the surprising response of the gracious, righteous, and sovereign Lord. You read verse 1 down through verse 3 and you get this picture. Woe is me, announcing his death, announcing his destruction. This is more than I can bear. I'm, I'm overwhelmed with weariness. I find no rest at all. So what does the Lord say? Thus shall you say to him, thus says the Lord, Behold, what I have built, I am breaking down. What I have planted, I am plucking up. That is, the whole land. And do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. What would be your counsel to a fellow believer who is discouraged, disheartened, and delusional? What, what, What would you say? How would you encourage him? Would you say something like, you know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life? Um, Would you say, well, you know, the Lord causes all things to work together for good to those who love Him are called according to His purpose. Would you say that He needs some time off? Would your counsel be, you know what you need to do? Take a day off. Just get away from things. Just pull away and relax. I mean... All of that seems reasonable given the circumstance. You love this person. You care about this person. So you want to help them out. But again, look at what the Lord does. I'm going to paraphrase it. Stop being so selfish. Wow. That's a little bit startling. God basically said to him, you know, Baruch, you need to quit whining and get over yourself. Go back to verse 3 and note how self-centered his complaint is. Woe's me. I've got such terrible lot. Things, I've got it so hard. And implied in that is I've got it worse than anybody else. I am weary with my groaning and I find no rest. And God's response serves to remind us of a very important principle. Every complaint like the sound system I don't know what happened either. Every complaint is ultimately a complaint against God. Now that's that's hard to accept, but I think it's true. If God is indeed sovereign, if, if nothing comes into our life but that the Lord allows it by His good and sovereign purpose and will, then every complaint I have about my circumstance is a complaint about Him. To express dissatisfaction in life 
is to express dis dissatisfaction with God. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying you never complain. I'm not saying you never are discouraged. I'm not saying, but I am saying there comes a point when we have to stop and recognize I'm expressing my hurt. I'm expressing my pain and God's big enough to handle that. But I'm actually complaining not just to Him, but about Him because I don't appreciate my lot. I don't appreciate what I'm being forced to experience or forced to go through. There's another principle I think here. And that is, as depression turns against God, it turns inward. As I become discouraged and disillusioned about things and I turn that, Lord, why? And have you ever done that? Lord, how come? Lord, why? As I begin to do that, all of my attention turns inward. And all I can see and all I can think about is where I am and what I'm experiencing and whatever that is gets larger and larger and larger. Because that's all that my mind can think about. That's why when you go through a physical trial that, that, that lays you up for a while, that, that causes you to be uh, homebound or causes you to be bedfast, it gets quickly out of hand because you're staring at those same walls all the time and your whole world starts closing in. So all that you can think about is your little 10-foot area or whatever. That's your whole world. And so you become consumed with your own experience and you can become consumed with your own perspective. Burke's whole focus was on his misery, his pain, his troubles. And God lovingly cut to the heart of the matter and said, quit seeking something for yourself. Consider everything that's going on and stop seeking something for yourself. We're not told specifically what it was but it's clearly turned inward. Maybe he's tired of being a secretary. Maybe he's like, you know, I'd like to try being a prophet for a while. I'd, li I'd like another job assignment. May maybe he wanted a little recognition. I'm writing all this down, but everybody can only talk about Jeremiah. I how about me? I'm, I'm involved in this too. Maybe that's part of it. I don't know. What I do know is that his heartache drove him to be consumed with himself. So God reminded him, there's a whole world outside of you. That's the point of verse 4. Thus say to him, thus says the Lord, Behold, what I've built, I'm breaking down. What I've planted, I'm plucking up. That is, the whole land. Baruch, I understand you're upset, but why don't you stop a minute and take a look around you and understand what I'm actually doing. And it isn't just you, the whole land. I'm bringing destruction on the nation. I am bringing this terrible judgment upon all the people. It's not just about you. It's not just what you are experiencing. And in a very real sense, the Lord is saying to Baruch, listen, the whole world's going to hell, so maybe you need to look up beyond yourself to what else is going on. Instead of being consumed about your own petty problem. It's not to say that it wasn't real. It's not to say that discouragement and disheartened and, and disillusion it is not a real problem that has to be dealt with and that it really is debilitating. I'm not saying that at all. 
But I think what the Lord is saying to him and what the Lord is saying to us in return is in hard and difficult times, part of the solution is to lift your eyes and consider the grand picture instead of just your little part of the world. And understand, you have not been singled out. It's not the universe is out to get Baruch. It's not that God is out to get Baruch. God is bringing judgment against His people. Lift your eyes. Stop and consider. I, I think part of it at least is the Lord saying, stop and consider what it's doing to me to destroy my own people. Because I, I think in our pain, we never consider the heart of God. We only see ourselves and what we're feeling. God is holy. I get that. God is different. I get that. He's transcendent. He's above. He's beyond. But the Scripture is also clear that God loves and God can be grieved. And a part of it is, understand. I'm not enjoying this. These are people that I love. These are people that I've entered into covenant with. And I found it fascinating today, just in, I don't know where you are in your daily reading, but uh, I'm, I'm reading in Deuteronomy today, and, and as, as the Lord's speaking through Moses to the people as they're getting ready to enter the land of promise, He, he made an interesting statement, and I don't know, I've, I've just never, I've just gone over it in the past. But as the Lord is talking to them and telling them, don't forget, remember, the Lord says to them, I will remember for you the covenant I made. And therefore you will not be destroyed. And I thought, that just really stuck out for me. I will remember for you. Because they're not going to remember. Because they're going to turn away. That, that was the habit of their, their life. That was the, the consistent pattern they exhibited. So we see this discouraged his heart, and we, we see this surprising word. Because in a real sense, when I read that, here's what I hear. I hear the Lord saying to his faithful, good, consistent servant, I'm sorry, are you drowning? Well, here, hold this anchor. I mean, that's, what it, that's how it reads to me. Are you seeking good for yourself? Well, don't bother. Because I'm bringing this destruction on the whole land. But it doesn't end there. There's one more verse. So I want you to see the reassuring comfort given by a gracious Savior. Baruch, you're discouraged, you're disheartened. I get that. Lift your eyes. Look beyond your circumstance. Understand this is the judgment that I promised for a long time. Decades I have been saying this is coming. And even beyond that, before that, I said this would happen. Go all the way back to Mount Sinai. Go all the way back to the time in the wilderness. And I said, if you turn away from me, this is the thing that's going to happen to you. And now for the last four decades through Jeremiah that you've been an intimate part of, I've been declaring this message. But look at verse 5. Do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not, for behold, I'm bringing great disaster upon all flesh, declares the Lord, but I will give you your life as a prize of war in all the places which you may go. Baruch is reprimanded and reassured in the same breath. God's promise to deliver him, <coughs> excuse me, no matter how difficult things get. He made the same promise to an African slave back in chapter 39 and verse 18. That, that African slave who was faithful and, and, and saw to the deliverance of Jeremiah, he made the same promise to him. <coughs> so I come back to what was mentioned at the beginning. 
Why is this prophecy here rather than back in chapter 36? I think as Baruch compiled these prophecies and put this at the end rather than earlier is because it's his testimony of the faithfulness of God. God promised he was trustworthy and true. The king sought his life back in chapter 36, but God preserved him. The city was destroyed, and yet he lived. He didn't deserve to be saved. He didn't deserve to be delivered. God did not owe it to him, but God chose in grace and mercy to save him. And he puts it here so it's a testimony post-experience. And it's the same for each of us. So the point of it all, why this small little chapter, just five verses near the end of Jeremiah's prophecy, I think it comes down to this. In times of great heartache and struggle, the disillusioned saint must look beyond his current trouble and cling to the sovereign promises of God. That's the whole point. Two keys. Look beyond and cling to. And that's hard. That's hard when it's things are when life is difficult. That's hard when all hell is breaking loose in your world and everything seems to be crumbling down around you. It's hard to look up and to look beyond that. If yet that is something that only the grace of God can enable you to do. And as you look beyond that, then you cling tenaciously to a sovereign God who's made promises to you. That's the life of faith. And that's the life we've been called to. Going back to, to something I, I think I said it a few Sunday mornings ago. Wouldn't it have been great if the Lord had just saved us and taken us out? Just take us to heaven now and we don't we get spared all of this. Why does He leave us here? Because He's building in us for eternity. And all the heartache and the joys and the victory and everything we experience here is part of the Lord's preparing us for the glory that is to come. Teaching us that these things we're told, they're really true. I, I get asked periodically about how I decide what book I'm going to preach through or, or what topics am I going to... And I say, well, I just go where I feel led to go. And I, I, the reason I preach through books is because it forces me to deal with things I wouldn't deal with if I just got to pick and choose what I want to talk about. Well, in 94, I preached through the book of Job. And uh, someone asked me once, said, well, you haven't preached through Job again. I said, well, no, and I probably never will. Because I spent a year preaching through Job about the sovereignty of God in the midst of all this trial and heartache, and 95 began with a brain tumor, and it ended with kidney stones. I think the Lord was preparing me for the, the storm. So, I don't want to go through that again. <laughs> but the truth is, in the midst of that storm, God graciously taught me that the things I had been teaching for years were actually true. Because you learn that in the midst of the storm rather than in the sunshine. I found that when you can't sleep because you're not sure about this surgery and they've told you it's going to be long and difficult and they're telling you all the things that could go wrong. You experience a peace and a comfort and you think, wow, that's really true. It's real. Look beyond and cling to the promise. God is sovereign. God is good, God is merciful, God is gracious, and He will provide. And sometimes that's all you got to go on. But what I want to say to you is, that is more than enough. Because He really is who He is. 
and he will do what he said he would do. So, child of God, heartache and trial are coming. If you're not in it now, you just came out of it, and or you're about to go in it. I mean, that's life in a fallen world. What do you do? Look beyond, and you trust God in the midst of it. Resting in His goodness, His grace, His mercy, and His promise. Because He is trustworthy. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for Your mercies and Your grace, for Your kindness and Your provision. And Lord, I'm grateful that it's in the midst of the trial that the truth becomes glorious. It's in the midst of the disillusionment and the disheartening time. In the darkness, the truth shines all the brighter. It's not easy. And I don't ever want to make light of it. And I don't ever be guilty of saying to someone in the midst of trial, oh, just get over it. I want to encourage all of us to look up, to trust the sovereign, good, gracious, merciful God and rest in Your presence and Your promise. Lord, teach us to live out that truth. And teach us to be quick in sharing that truth with others. Not that when somebody else is going through trial, we give them a big lecture on it. But as we sit with them, and as we cry with them, and as we hurt with them, by grace and by Your enabling, we also encourage them to look beyond and trust in You. May we be marked as a people who trust in the sovereignty of God in such a way it's not some cold, detached truth that we throw around easily. It is a living reality in which we rejoice. Father, thank You for Your presence, for Your loving care, and Your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.